Uh, welcome everybody. My name is Kev Fitzpatrick. I'm the Shepherd of the Lambs, which is what they call the Woo! Woo! Who, has, who has never been here before? Wow, a lot of you. Welcome, welcome. Well, the Lambs started in 1874. We're the country's oldest, large, oldest theatrical organization. Um, it was started as a social club by seven men on Christmas week, December 1874. So next year we turn... I think you guys have watched too many Disney movies. Um, yes, yeah, so next year is our sesquicentennial, which is a really good New York Times word. Um, it's great we're talking about the topic we're talking about tonight because it was Lambs who founded uh, the Actors Fund. It was Lambs that founded the first Actors Burial Ground in Brooklyn. It was Lambs who helped co-found the first Actors Home in Staten Island turn of the century. It was Lambs that found Actors' Equity. 33 of the 34 members were Lambs. And it was a Lamb whose painting is right over there. William Portland said at the first meeting, why don't we just call it Equity? Which is going to talk about just after Labor Day. Uh, Lambs all found ASCAP, SAG, AFTRA, any organizations collecting money to help show business people work, the Lambs had a, as a tie-in. And so um, it's nice today as there's a current strike going on that some of our members are on the strike lines today. And it's really great to have Jake here because um, he actually has the first book out about the strike today. I mean, you've beaten everybody about the strike. <laughs> that is incredible. Oh wait, this is 1941. <laughs> um, but the Lambs are a social organization. We are a social club. So we have quite a few activities uh, in the clubhouse and online. Um, a lot of things to tie uh, show business professionals together. People are up and coming in the arts. Um, a couple of things we have coming up soon. I'm going to come back and visit us. On the 21st, we have another book talk with Dan Callahan called Bing and Billy and Frank and Ella and Judy and Barbara. Do I need to put any last names on that? <laughs> <laughs> and we'll have music uh, going along with those performers as well, too. The 22nd, we're having a trivia bowl up on the roof. We have rooftop access. We have a fantastic roof terrace. October 4th, down in the restaurant pub, is Italian night. So a little Corleone action going on with the music and food. And um, on the 6th, on the 6th, we have a frolic, and that's the Gothic frolic. So we're going to have a tarot reading, cocktails, we have a bar up here, seance maybe, and it's all Victorian. Um, but the Lambs is very happy to, to support um, all kinds of writers and artists that, that come in. So it's really great to have Jake coming tonight. I'll tell you a little bit about this guy. Uh, he's a New York-based writer, teacher, and artist. He has written for the HuffPo, the Philadelphia Inquirer, Animation Magazine, American History Magazine, and many others. He's contributed to documentaries for ABC and PBS, and for 10 years he worked as an animation artist for films and television that's seen on Nickelodeon, Disney Channel, Saturday Night Live, and for 20th Century Fox. He was taught animation history at NYU Tisch and mm -hmm. RISD, and has lectured at Cal Arts and at USC. His other books include The Art of Blue Sky Studios, and the forthcoming Disney Afternoon, The Making of Television Renaissance. Please welcome Jake Friedman. Thank you. Thank you. It's okay, photos, whatever you want. Hi everybody, thank you so much for coming. I'm here to talk about my book, The Disney Revolt. Um, I'm going to do something with your help, something that I've never done before and that I've never asked anyone else to do. I'm going to ask everyone here to help bring in a little bit of that energy of the 1941 Disney strike with us together. Because um, as I was playing this video, not video, it was actually like a 16 millimeter film at the time, uh, these scenes shot during the 1941 Disney strike kind of show everything that was going on between the picketing and between the sitting in the fields across the street from the studio for about three months from oh yes from 19 uh, from May 28 1941 until for for exactly three months during the the stretch of the summer uh, Upwards of 330 Disney artists went out on strike, just a little bit more than half of the Disney artists at the studio. Dumbo was in production. So was Bambi. Both of those projects seemed to be threatened at the time. And speaking of threatened, over in Europe, they were fighting Hitler before the US had joined the war effort. 
But here, stateside, unions were going strong. Uh, and over at Disney, these hundreds of Disney animators, artists, inkers, painters, storyboard artists, and their friends and partners picketed around the Disney studio for these three months, asking for union representation. And during the hours in between start time and end time, sign in and sign out, they would gather in this field across the street from the studio, which smelled like eucalyptus from the eucalyptus trees, many of which still stand in the Burbank area. And they had their meetings, brought everyone up to speed. Remember, this is before text messaging or WhatsApp. And they would update each other and also ri uh, give rise to their spirits. Because it was arduous, if you can imagine the heat here, what was it like in Los Angeles during that summer in 1941? And among the things that they did to lift their spirits was skits, magic shows. They did a whole like uh, a whole like extravaganza where they invited people to come and buy tickets. And there were people who put on skits and sang songs, original songs that were specific to the Disney strike. In my research, which I'll talk about in a little bit. I found one of their original songs from 1941, which has not been sung in a chorus for 82 years. And I thought we can imagine ourselves together sitting on that field as Disney artists and sing this song <laughs> together. What do you say? Are you with me? Yeah. Let's do it. Tell us about the ants. The ants. They ate. They ate on the on the uh, grove of the field, and sometimes ants got in their food. Sometimes it wasn't all glamorous, believe it or not. So let's talk about some 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 terms and words to keep it in context. Um, when uh, when you're axed at your job, what does that mean? Fired. 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 If someone calls you a red, what does that mean? What are they calling you? Communist. Communist. The name of the song is Little Red Axe. It's sung in the voice of Walt Disney. How happy he is to wield his little red axe. So whoever performed this, and I don't know who wrote these words, I don't know who sang this, if not the entire crowd of Disney strikers, uh, but they did it in the voice of Walt Disney, trying to bring some humor and levity to their cause. A few other terms to know, in case you didn't know, uh, Walt Disney built his first studio in Kansas City. Um, the Screen Cartoonist Guild was the animators union. The exclusive club for top earning animators was called the Penthouse Club and only people earning above $100 a week could access it and other artists who worked there were not allowed to. This was part of the class system that made a lot of people unhappy. Um, the kind of pencils they used were called scriptos. So when we talk about scriptos, we talk about animators pencils. And in case you're not familiar with the term fink, while we're at it, a scab. A scab is someone who walks through the picket line and goes to work. And a fink can be that, or sometimes someone who's hired to break the strike and walk through the picket line, who didn't even work there before. So when you see the word fink, or even scab, think of that. OK, we're all up to speed. This is my friend and musical partner tonight, Josh Ehrlich. Hello. And in case you're not familiar with the very old folk song, uh, Little Brown Jug, this whole thing is to that tune, we're going to just teach you this chorus. And I'm going to ask everyone to join me in singing the chorus together. And I'm going to embarrass myself by singing the verses. And the chorus goes a little something. I like this. Yo ho ho, you and me, little red axe, how I love thee. Oh. You and me, little red axe, how I love thee. Okay, wow. you guys know it. That's it, that's it. So we're going to sing this together. Should we go over how the middle of the chorus and the end are a little different? The first, the first time we go up, little red axe, how I love thee. And the second time we go, Little red axe, how I love thee. Other than that, you got it. Josh is also a teacher. <laughs> a very excellent one. Thank you. OK, so let's get started. I'm the Kansas City kid. Do you know what I have? 
accepted. Fire guild leaders up and down and gave them all the run around. Yo ho ho, you and me, little red axe, how I love thee. Yo ho ho, you and me, little red axe, how I love thee. You guys are so good. Once I had a lad so meek, paid him sixteen bucks a week, fired him when he asked for more, then had tea on the penthouse floor. Yo ho ho, you and me, little red axe, how I love thee. Yo ho ho, you and me, little red axe, how I love thee. I had a boy so smart, he won a championship in art. When he asked for raisin dough, he got two tickets to the picture show. Yo ho ho, you and me, little red axe, how I love thee. Yo ho ho, you and me, little red axe, how I love thee. I had a man who worked for me. He was as fast as he could be. His budget came out in the red, cause I charged him for his script OLED. Yo ho ho, you and me, little red axe, how I love thee. Yo ho ho, you and me, little red axe, how I love thee. Some guys out from the east promised 75 at least. Artists shouldn't think of pay. Art for art's sake's what I say. Yo ho ho, you and me, little red axe, how I love thee. Yo ho ho, you and me, little red axe, how I love thee. bonuses galore that will make their paychecks more the boys turn into nervous wrecks working for their bonus checks yo ho ho you and me little red axe how i love thee yo ho ho you and me little red axe how i love thee I had a girl who inked, taught her how to be a fink. She finked how long, I do not know. When the strike's over, I'll let her go. Yo ho ho, you and me, little red axe, how I love thee. Yo ho ho, you and me, little red axe, how I love thee. Yo ho ho, you and me, little red axe, how I love thee. Yo ho ho, you and me, little red axe, how I love thee. Josh Ehrlich, everyone. That was great. So this was the first time this song was sung in 82 years by a group of people, some of whom are union members, I understand. So excellent. Thank you for bringing that moment of the Disney strike to life. I'm going to start out by telling how I got into this racket. <laughs> because people always want to know. It started with my mentor, John Colane. He was a Disney historian himself, and he was a professor of mine when I was at NYU. He was also a Disney <laughs> live action model for Mr. Snoops, from The Rescuers, and from the characters called Flying John from Fantasia 2000. Yeah, he was that model. He also wrote these terrific books. The one in the middle, the Aladdin one, was given to me when I was 12, and it changed my life. And this is me and him back in 2007. Uh, yeah, he is an animation historian in heaven right now. But uh, yeah, but um, I, he he. It was on this day that he gave me this assignment. He asked me to come to his class, and he said that I was going to write this book. He didn't ask me. He said, "You're going to do this." He knew I loved animation history. He believed in me, and I hope that everyone here has a mentor who believes in them too. But I was extremely daunted. I knew who Art Babbitt was. He said, Art Babbitt, the strike leader, you're going to write his story. I knew he was a big Disney animator from the olden days. I knew that he animated these uh, main characters. He was a supervising animator for Geppetto, Wicked Queen, the Stork in Dumbo, the Mushrooms in Fantasia, that mouse is from a cartoon called The Country Cousin that won an Oscar. And of course, he's known as the father of Goofy, which I'll talk a little bit about, but I didn't really know anything else about him. So I wanted to explore more. 
I knew that that's him, the elderly fellow on the left. He died in 1992. I never had a chance to meet him, Art Babbitt. But I did meet his widow. That's Barbara Babbitt. And for about uh, 10 years, maybe 12, I would fly to Los Angeles and spend a week with her. And in her, kind of like a basement, she called it a cubby hole, was every single item that she or her husband, her late husband, Art Babbitt, the strike leader, had ever saved. There were filing cabinets filled with movies, tin canisters of home movies. There were audio recordings. There were old photos going back to the 20s when he was working as an ad man in New York. I was holding his Disney ID card from 1936, the year his film won an Oscar. I was holding his termination notice from 1941 on Disney stationery. I got a chance to get to know him as well as anyone can. And when you're holding a man's diary, you really feel you get to know him. This book is not anti-Disney. And it's not anti-Walt Disney. I'm not trying to fight against the company. I love Disney. There's me loving Disney. Oh. 1983. Yes, I still do. I was indoctrinated and I still do. I also love unions and I love the promises that unions can make. I was indoctrinated in that as well. Both my teachers were members of the Philadelphia, uh, what's that? Both your parents. Both my parents were, were, were teachers and members of the Philadelphia Teachers Union. And uh, this photo during the Philadelphia Teachers Union was taken when uh, it being illegal for teachers to strike, being public city workers, the teachers were arrested, taken in paddy wagons and put in the slammer. And that man in the glasses and beard is my dad. Wow. So this was a family relic that I became aware of at a very early age. And I thought, how cool is it that my dad was a badass? <laughs> But it, he was the only one who had his photo taken. My mom also was arrested for going on strike. And her mom, my grandmother, they all served time in jail for striking as teachers during the 73 Philadelphia teachers strike. A bit about me. I worked in animation for about 10 years. I worked on these projects and others. I really have a feel for the kind of personalities that attracts people, uh, the, uh, the animation industry. And uh, as I was going through these files, I was able to piece together my own experience as an animator, working on things for Disney, and working on things for like 20th Century Fox, and working on things for Nickelodeon, and really have breathed life into the research that I was finding. So Art Babbitt, I'm gonna try and breathe some of that life in, in it for you guys. There's, a, there's Art Babbitt, he was a supervising animator. That's a classic animator setup. And at Disney, he kind of rose to the ranks rather quickly. He was hired in 1932, and by 1935, he, or late 35, he was a supervising animator. It was exceptionally fast, even then. Uh, let's look over on the other side in Kansas City, Walt Disney. Can you all spot Walt Disney as a teenager? He's the person in the middle. There he is working in the Kansas City Film Ad Company, just doing some basic advertisements. And this, I apologize for this photo, it's literally 100 years old. 1920s, New York City, Art Babbitt on the left as a teenager working at an ad company in Times Square, holding what I can only assume is a bottle of illegal alcohol. <laughs> Here's a photo of the Kansas City Film Ad crew where Walt Disney was working. Can you spot young Walt Disney in this photo? The jaunty fellow, three, two, one, on Chris Cat. Yep, he's sitting on that pedestal on the right. And meanwhile, over in New York, Art Babbitt was working at an animation studio when he was around the same age. This is at Terry Toons. Terry Toons was making uh, a cartoon series that we probably don't know very well called Farmer Alfalfa. Later on they would do Mighty Mouse and Heckle and Jekyll, but back then their cartoons were uh, pretty poor. But they were a training ground for a lot of folks, not just Art Babbitt, but the dashing fellow with a shock of black hair, his name is Bill Tightly, he became a supervising animator too at Disney. And oddly enough, 
Their paths were so close that when Babbitt was an independent commercial artist working for himself and Walt Disney went in to record the sound for Steamboat Willie in 1928, they were literally two doors down from each other, <laughs> spinning distance from each other in 1928. They may have crossed paths. If I were to make a docu-pic, I would have them like brushing elbows against each other. Hey, watch it. And it's three blocks away from here. That's true. Look at where we are. We can walk by that building right now. The Smart Strand Theater. 1932, here's a beautiful group shot of Walt Disney, of course, in the middle. Can you all spot Art Babbitt? Bottom left. Laughing with his buds. If anyone here is a Disney aficionado, I'm sure you can spot some other future Disney legends, but he's at the bottom left corner. Art Babbitt, laughing it up with his friends. They were all around, uh, like, mid-20s. It was... It was quite a young cohort. Walt was barely 30 at the time. As far as how that first introduction met, uh, how Art met Walt, here he is telling his own story in his own words about how he met Walt Disney. I edited together some of his original audio that I found with some of his original home movies that I found. Let's hear what Art had to say. And remember, he's telling this as an old man, so let's see if we can get an idea of the personality that he has that would maybe play a role in his in these events later on. Well, you wouldn't expect me at all. And in fact, I had a round trip ticket because I had no faith in myself and I think I had 40 hours of spending with me for the last year until I got back to New York. Well, that was it. You know, I was in you know, and Disney said that, uh, first of all, that they had a full complement of artists, they could afford to hire me, so I squelched that by telling them that I didn't want any money, you know, I was willing to work for three months for nothing. At the end of that time, you would either pay me what I was worth or you could fire me. He said, well, he didn't have any room for me, and I told him I only take up a space about four feet by six feet, and uh, I'm sure they could squeeze me in someplace. And as I was leaving his office, I said, please show me the courtesy of not throwing my name and address in the wastebasket before I slammed the door. But the next day, I did get a call to come in and go to work. Okay. That's how he met Walt Disney, in his own words. And as I said, he rose through the ranks really quickly. This was a photo shoot for a 1935 film called Peculiar Penguins. Uh, and the reason I'm showing you this photo is because in this particular photo, we have Walt, there he is sitting on the table cradling a cute penguin. And Ted Sears, the head of story, to his left. Um, to the right is Wilfred Jackson, basically the, the top director, the top shorts director at the time. Head story person, head director. Next to Wilfred Jackson is Art Babbitt, top animator. Walt's brain trust. And some photos that I found of him hanging out with some of the, the Disney folks inside the Disney studio. Some of the Christmas cards he exchanged with them. Um, Les Clark was one of his good friends. He became one of the nine old men, if you all know the term. Les Clark gave him a Christmas card of him holding a newspaper that says, Les Clark sends greetings. Uh, and here is, here's Don Graham. Don Graham under the uh, Don Graham Memorial Institute. He's not dead. They're just calling it the Memorial Institute just for fun. He was the art teacher that Art Babbitt helped bring into the Disney Studio when he realized that we need these animators to know how to do figure drawing. It was an idea he had back in New York. Art, he went to the Art Students League and other places like that. And yeah, the motto under it, because these are Disney animators, is Semper Gluteus Maximus, or always your ass. <laughs> and uh, an even better shot right there. And, and this Disney art school ended up training not just, not just everyone at Disney, but anyone who had left Disney. Uh, Art had this footage, and yes, it's originally in color. He had a color reel, a film, that he was <coughs> animating at his desk at Disney's. <laughs> and he just has this footage of some of his friends walking around. Now, this uh, volleyball net 
and uh, court, it was on the Disney lot. This was a way for artists to blow off steam. If anyone is a fan of some of the nine old men, we have a couple of them here. They're all telling Art, turn off that camera, get out of here, go. <laughs> Art wasn't really one of the sporty guys. He was more of the intellectuals. He would pick up books. That is, uh, by the way, the, the typical smock that the inkers and painters would wear, so they would <coughs> put paint on their clothes. You couldn't smoke inside where the animation cells were because they're flammable. If you needed to smoke, you had to go outside. Anyway, other cool treasures I encountered. Things that the Disney Studio didn't release in the 30s. This is called a pencil test. This is really what made Disney animation explode through the ceiling. They would test their animation. Today we kind of take it for granted. But at the time, the Disney Studio was the only studio doing this. It, it's expensive. It takes time and time is money. Not to mention the resources of paper and film and film development. But they realized that's the only way you can get better at your craft. This was not commercially released. This is literally someone looking at a pencil test being screened in a Disney Studio theater and pointing their movie camera at the screen. Just so they can capture what a pencil test looks like. I think it's so cool to see the magic of the actual strokes of the pencil. See that character and connect it through the hand of the person drawing. But I said that he was the father of Goofy. What does that mean? Well, he got into the head of Goofy and into the body of Goofy in very unique ways, and, is and he became a Goofy specialist. Down at the bottom, you see that as animator, the person credited is Babbitt. He was also the supervisor uh, animator for Geppetto. But let's hear how he... That he has a very interesting story about um, directing the voice actor and live action model for Geppetto. So I was directing an actor by the name of Christian Rude to do Geppetto. And I had a very subtle scene I was directing and he would keep hamming it up, you know, exaggerating it. And it was supposed to be done very quietly, very softly. And finally he became exasperated and there's a whole sound stage full of people watching this process. And he blew his top, he said, I have been doing this this way for 40 years. I said, fine, now we will do it correctly. <laughs> okay, yeah, so that's Art Babbitt, right? So I'd like to think that he's really significant, the top Disney artist for four reasons. The art school, character analysis, breaking the joints, live, live action reference. I'm going to hit upon each one of these. The art school, Don Graham. It was Art Babbitt who had live models come to his home, his private home. Walt got wind of it, said, we can't have naked ladies go to Disney artist's home. The press will have a field day. Babbitt said, okay, let's do it here in the studio. Walt said, great. I'll provide the space, we'll use the sound stage, I'll provide the paper. He asked how much do artists charge. Uh, Babbitt thought for a second, doubled the rate, told Walt, and that's how much the, the, art, the, 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 uh, the figure models, excuse me, the figure models were paid. Don Graham was brought in from Chenard's, which is now called Cal Arts, and there we go. And here is our, uh, Walt Disney in his later years talking about the significance of the art school in his own words. Service Walt, one of the principal technical advances in the animated cartoon since the time of Fantasia. Better drawing. Uh, the first thing I did when I got a little money to experiment, I uh, put all my artists back in school. We, uh, uh, art schools that existed then didn't quite have enough uh, for what we needed, so we set up our own art school. You were inventing a new art anyway. Well, yes, but we were just going a little bit beyond what they were getting in the art school where they work with the static figure. Now, we were dealing in, in motion, movement, the flow of movement, the flow of things, you know, action, reaction, all of that. So we had to set up our own school. And out of that school would come the, the artists that uh, now make up my staff here, and more than that, 
the artists that make up all of the, most all of the cartoon outfits in Hollywood uh -huh. were, were directly or indirectly out of my school. And that's true. It was a hugely influential part of why Disney Animation was big and why it, why it was miles above every other competing studio. Brought in by Art Babbitt. Character analysis. Art Babbitt was reading a lot of this thing called method acting. This was new in the 30s. He said, why should it only apply to live action films? Let's have these character analyses of our cartoon characters. He sat down and wrote a three-page treatise about Goofy. And when you're exploring... Yeah, he's a philosopher of the barbershop variety. I love that, but when you're digging deep into a man's memoirs, or not even memoirs, into his history, into his relics, you get little treasures, and one of them was his diary. And in his diary, he wrote about a trip in which he went back to New York and found his old Italian barber. And he writes, my old Italian barber says, death, she's a not such a bad a thing in life. And I thought, wow, that sounds like something that Goofy might say. <laughs> so he's taking his barber's influence, plugging it into Goofy. And in my research, I found that Goofy is really a composite of all these different influences that he found throughout his life. All these different people, from his dad to someone he worked with at Terry Tunes, were all plugged in to make Goofy. The way Goofy moves is incredibly unique. Let's hear Babbitt talk about that. One thing about the character Goofy is the fact that he walks in an impossible manner. Being an iconoclast, I took all the rules of animation and broke them. Did everything wrong I possibly could. And it's better than if you do it right. So let that be a lesson to you. <laughs> right? I feel like you're all getting a feel for who this man was, right? And another significant part was the live action reference. Probably the element that wouldn't, that it was the key to unlocking the secret to animating human characters, including Snow White herself and the Queen. So he had a home video camera and he brought it to the studio and he used it for reference. Here's some footage I found in his home, a majorette. And here's some of his animation. Now, this is not rotoscoping. The word rotoscoping means you're tracing the live action. He's clearly not tracing the majorette. He's using the majorette to inform Goofy's action. The idea of taking movement specialists, like majorettes or dancers, and using that to help inform the animator's movements of a character, that was completely Babbitt. Here he is talking about how he did that with Marge Champion, the model for Snow White herself. This is Marge Belcher who played the part of Snow White and I shot it with my own 16 millimeter camera on the sound stage of the old studio on Hyperion Avenue. He uh, also used the camera for studying. He got some of the walks things from the movie character. Uh, many different things he photographed and he studied afterwards. Um, like the art class we all picked up on and said, hey, we ought to get that to the studio and have everybody do it. So uh, everybody did do it. But art was the one who did the first work with it. And uh, art was the one who made things happen. This is Frank Thomas. He was one of Art Babbitt's peers at Disney. He was also a super, super star of an animator. He did not go out on strike. He was, a, he was a loyal animator to Walt. And the fact that he's saying this, and this happened to be shot at Babbitt's memorial service after he had died, he's giving Babbitt credit for bringing these things to the studio. Um, and a couple other things. Now that we're, giving, we're getting a feel for what the Disney studio was like in 19, 1930s up to 1940, up to Snow White, I was able to kind of see that there was a shift. Up to 1937, when everyone's working on these shorts and then up to Snow White, it's like, a, as they say, a big group of happy pirates. Everyone's in it to win it, all for one and one for all. If we succeed, we'll succeed together. If we fail, we will fail as one. They didn't know if Snow White would succeed. Of course, Snow White did succeed. Oops. I'm not gonna show, I, we're 
kind of crunching on time. But there's a, there's a uh, newsreel that you can watch. And in that newsreel, we see a clip of this, the title card from Snow White. This is the actual title card of Snow White. And I think it's interesting how Walt Disney writes this in his title card, my sincere appreciation to the members of my staff whose loyalty and creative endeavor made possible this production. Isn't it interesting, I thought to myself, that Walt Disney is listing the main two qualities he finds most valuable in his staff. And which one of those two qualities comes first? In my research, I went to the NYU Bopes Library. I happened to begin my research, or was it end my research? I, I think there, I ended my research on the anniversary of the Triangle Shirtwaist fire, and there was a big, which happens to be right across the street from the library, and there was a big parade commemorating that day, which as we all know, basically uh, sparked a surge of union activity when all these garment workers perished because their union was not accepted and they were fighting for safe labor conditions which were not granted. I started to gather my research. I, I created a blog just to gather my research. Babbitt blog. Rolls off the tongue. It's still, it's still there. I picked up some books, but I noticed that there was not a, a lot written about the strike. Maybe a chapter at most. I went down to, in that book by the way, I found a breadcrumb and that breadcrumb led me here to CSU, Northridge. There's a, a library that has a bunch of labor materials. In that library, I found this, among hundreds of other sheets and photos. And so slowly, the Disney strike was coming alive for me. Some footage of the strike, we had seen some already, and Art Babbitt's role in it started to be all the more highlighted. A piece of art drawn by, the, stu by uh, uh, the artist inside the studio. Unsigned, we don't know who did it, but it's clearly made on animation paper. May 28th, 1941, the day, first day of the strike. The first day artists working on Dumbo did not show up for work. Caricatures of Walt started to permeate newspapers. <laughs> Walt is caricatured as the reluctant dragon, which is a movie that exists, but here they started calling him the reluctant Disney. The memos and bulletins they passed around had little cartoons, little caricatures of Walt. Walt standing as Napoleon. You don't think I'm crazy, do you, Gunny? Gunny is Gunther Lessing. Gunther Lessing is the vice president of the studio. And it is Gunther Lessing that even at the time and after, people on the inside and outside blamed for the bitterness and lack of resolution for the Disney strike. He's, the reason they drew him with a sombrero is because he bragged that he was Pancho Villa's lawyer when Pancho Villa was negotiating his movie contract to make a silent film about his, his life. So that was something that, that, uh, that Gunther Lessing would tell everyone at the studio. But the more I dug about Gunther Lessing, again, vice president of the company, the person closest to Walt's ear, the more I found that he was more than just a figure at his right hand, the more I realized that he held significant influence. Some of the art was, I just thought, too fun to miss out these memos, these pamphlets that they would either give to other studios, other animators, people on the street, people outside the movie theater to show why, they, why they're picketing these movie theaters that are showing Disney films. And of course, the studio would start different tactics saying in the middle of the strike that the strike was over, everyone shouldn't worry, when in fact the strike was not, not resolved at the time. Hence that dramatic image of Donald Duck bashing the radio. There's Walt Disney as the reluctant Disney, again, refusing a contract that was presented to him. A 10-piece picket sign of Walt as the reluctant Disney. Unfair, it says, across his body. 
And if you happen to go see The Reluctant Dragon, which was released in July 1941, you would be given pamphlets like this, showing Walt as a greedy dragon wanting money, and the other character in the film, the young squire, drawing and drawing and drawing. And it's just some of the efforts of the strike, it was, it was so tightly organized with many different departments, media department, press department. Uh, there were, uh, all of these roles are laid out in the Disney Revolt and there's even an appendix that shows who did what which I was able to uncover. And before I, I end this shot over here, the man on the, on the right with the wide-brimmed hat and the wide shoulders, that's Willis Pyle. He lived to 102. He lived on the Upper West Side and we were friends. I, I would ride my bike to his apartment. He was so friendly, his mind was sharp as a tack and, we, and he would just tell me stories until, until he passed away in 2016. And although he was one of my links to this time, as was Marge Champion, or Marge Belcher, the model for Snow White, she also lived on, on the Upper West, and we spent some time together. I interviewed her about three times. And she married Art Babbitt. Did I say that? No. <laughs> they, got, they got married. She was his wife. Uh, and of course, now she passed away too. But she was able to provide me with another of these links. But I didn't want my story to be people's recollections. That seems to be uh, what other books or articles that mention the strike seem to do, that they would talk about people's recollections or opinions years, decades after the fact. Usually after the events have colored their opinion so much, they were looking at it through a distorted lens. I mean, I can't remember what I had for breakfast last week. I don't, I'm sure most of you can't remember what you had one week ago for breakfast. How are you going to remember the events of a strike that happened 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago? So I put all my efforts into uncovering what the strike was with records from that time. I used, yes, there were newspapers. I used diaries. I used letters that were written. And I used, in this case, I found here, uncovering in this in the uh, National Archives of San Francisco, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, I found sort of the King Tut's tomb of it all. This was from another breadcrumb that I just followed to the end. When Walt Disney fired Art Babbitt, Babbitt and the National Labor Relations Board sued. And it was appealed. And because it was appealed, the entire record was in the Court of Appeals. Every page of testimony from every day, every bit of evidence from that trial was in this document. This is a 1,500 page document and I read every page. It was fascinating. There were some cool treats in there. Like here, Walt Disney's testimony when he's brought to the stand. There were some cool pieces of art that the Disney Studio put down. Like storyboards or model sheets or the actual theater program for Pinocchio's release. That was evidence. Why was it evidence? Because of, although the credits aren't as robust as on this program, on the program you can see Art Babbitt's name. But what I found most interesting, and which I was eager to incorporate in the book, were transcripts of conversations that existed between Waltz folks and Art Babbitt, or sometimes union leaders and Art Babbitt. The secretaries at Disney were such good stenographers, they kept copious dictation from what everyone uh, said at a meeting. And so we have here an actual word-for-word -word conversation, reading it is like you're a fly on the wall, of what happened at a meeting at the Disney studio. In this case, this was two months before the Disney strike. And Walt, basically the head of HR, calls Babbitt into his office. Um, oh, I take it back. It's not two weeks before this, right? This is, or two months. This is two months. This is a few months before Snow White. 
uh, when the director, Dave Hand, is trying to tell Art Babbitt that he needs to sh like shape up. He is, he is working independently instead of following directions. I found Art Babbitt's contract. I found some, some notes from the sweat box. That's the camera test room. This is the conversation that I thought I was showing you guys. This is between HR and Art Babbitt. And uh, rather than having us read it, I thought I would show you a reenactment. Is that okay with you? Yes. Okay. This is a couple of months before the strike. I give you Art Babbitt and the head of Disney's HR department, Hal Adelquist. Okay. Oh, sure. uh, I wanted to have my secretary here for the record. Um, listen. <clears throat> Anybody? A few complaints regarding you personally have come to my attention. I uh, want to refer you again to Walt's memo to please carry on union activity either at lunchtime or after 5.30. It's come up that you've been going to the and talking to the fellow here to prove that. There's no need to prove anything. When I go to the coffee shop, if I talk to anybody, I do it there. People on both sides are guilty. Dan McManus can tell you he took one and a half hours of my time last week. Yesterday, Bernie Wolf came in and spent almost an hour. And I don't want to call all those boys and remind them of Wolf. I'm not taking sides. All the complaints have come to me that you personally have been going to the rooms, talking with the boys during working hours. Yes, I've done that. I must deny it. But when I go into a room, like... Bill Tightlock. I see him every day. I don't spend more than five minutes. Same with Les Clark. You understand what I mean. Both Bodle and Yeager and the Labor Board have already cautioned me, so I'm being very careful. If the boys do drop into your room during company time, I would appreciate it. Uh, to make it after business hours. Right now, but... <sighs> We're in such a condition right now that the thing we need is production. We need it so badly that if we don't get it, there won't be any unions. And the more time you take from the man who should be contributing work is bad. We don't want to discontinue the coffee shop and those privileges, but if we don't get out the work, we're going to have to. And if it was someone else from the other union, I would tell him the same thing and ask him to be fair and honest. And I, I, I have no excuse for myself, but I'm more or less in the position where I'm under scrutiny by everybody. Anyone who's not on my side is bound to criticize if me. If fellows on your respective sides could only agree that working time here at the studio should be consumed in working, and any other discussion should, should be after hours. But we have the right to say that since we're paying a man for a particular type of work, we have the right to expect work for it. I've tried to cooperate. I have talked at the union meetings about it, and I have to prove by actions what my feelings are. It's only a question of time. Well, on that, I'm very neutral. What I wanted to talk to you about was that I would appreciate you fellows cooperating with Walt. It's the one thing he asked for, for the men to give him a fair deal. He doesn't care what happens off the lot. I'm inclined to believe he doesn't give a damn what happens off the lot. You know, we've noticed that your work on Dumbo, on the store itself, I, I know that things are taking longer than we had anticipated, but that has nothing to do with union talk or otherwise. I'm simply trying to get the best work possible, like I always do! <clears throat> there have been complaints that you personally have solicited for unions during company hours and have been taking other people's time. That's true. I just wanted to caution you about it. I'm only asking for your sense of fair play on the thing. If fellas do come into your room, tell them that you're busy, but we have to talk to them on your own time. I would tell the same thing to the opposing interest. Okay, that's all. Okay, again, that was a real conversation that happened at the Disney studio months before the strike. I promise to tell you about Gunther Rising. There he is on the left. The bald fellow. There's Walt in the middle. He's signing a merchandising contract. Uh, and his, his brother Roy is on the far right. Gunther was, was there for all of these big deals. He had joined the Disney studio. He had joined Walt in 1929 to help them protect his, his intellectual property. And he became uh, a staff employee on January 1st, 1930. And for a long time, he was kind of like a, a friendly 
older fuddy-duddy, one of the oldest people at the studio because everyone's in their 20s and 30s. This is at a dinner party. There's Art on the left, and there's Marge, the smile for Snow White in the wonderful hat. And there's Gunther Lessing just chatting with them. Les Clark. And then fast forward to 1941, here is an effigy of Gunther Lessing <laughs> hanging from a telephone pole, not wanted, dead or alive. <laughs> Aliens, Gunther Lessing. So cartoons like this from the, the regular Strike Bulletin really shows that Gunther Lessing, even in the minds of the Strikers, was there the sidewalls at every, at every turn. Art Babbitt in his later years would say, I think of all the lousy things that happened during the strike, and afterwards I would say that 50% of it was caused by outside influences, namely Gunther Lessing, and he named the fake labor specialist that Disney hired, name of Anthony O'Rourke. A non-striker, Ward Kimball, in a letter writes this, how, when asked how do you feel the settlement could have been sp speeded up, he writes, by Gunther Lessing's early demise, he hated unions and brainwashed 50% Walt, I think. Interesting, we have the same opinion from the inside and outside. Another unsavory character who happens to step into this story is Willie Byoff. He is, um, I don't know, can you, can you guess that he's one of Al Capone's henchmen? <laughs> <laughs> because he is. I touch upon the role of uh, the mob from Chicago, where he sort of got his feet off the ground as a wise guy, and how they made their way once Prohibition ended in 1932, how unions were the next big score. And so they crept into this very loosely regulated thing called labor unions, loosely regulated at the time, and realized that if you get a bunch of projectionists at movie theaters signed up for a union. You can go to the person who owns those theaters, say, I'm gonna take all your projectionists out on strike, they will not work for you, and uh, all, of, all of this equipment and rent that is being paid for is gonna be wasted money if you don't pay me $100,000. They would pay him $100,000. He was blackmailing Hollywood in no time. And then for some bizarre reason in July, Walt started to do negotiations with Willie Byoff as a possible labor negotiator. And so these are some of the pictures and words that the Disney strikers put out at that time. Walt hiding behind Willie Byoff. Walt shaking hands with Willie Byoff. A big full page ad in Variety from the strikers. Willie Byoff is not our leader. Negotiate with us. I'm not gonna tell you what happened to Willie Byoff. It's too, too good. But I will tell you that the end of the strike was in favor of the strikers. That's the spoiler I'm happy to share with you. The strike won. All the animation artists were able to have a union represent them. They all got reinstated, at least at that time. And they got um, not just a big portion of their lost wages, but they got the uh, conditions that they were fighting for. More than anything, they just wanted the right for collective bargaining. The Disney Studio was the last studio uh, to have uh, an animator's union. At the time, there were six, Disney, uh, six animation studios. Warner Brothers, think of Bugs Bunny. MGM, think of Tom and Jerry. Uh, Paramount, Universal a little one called George Powell, which did like stop motion. They all had animation uh, unions. Disney was the last holdout. Animators were the last craft in Hollywood to not have a union. With the Disney strike succeeding, now all the animators in Hollywood had a union, and now all the studios had their crafts represented. The union's success at the Disney strike was that now Hollywood was a wall-to-wall -wall union town. And the artists there at Disney still have a union to this day. It lasted, it's still in place. The story of Art Babbitt is a little bit different. He found that his experience there was a little bit too toxic for his own good. 
he ended up kind of being a, a wayward wanderer for a few decades, doing some work here, doing some work there. And it wasn't until the 70s when he was discovered as a teacher that he was found to be a great uh, source of knowledge. He taught the people who ended up animating Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which itself was a movie that helped uh, bring about the animation renaissance. So Art Babbitt is a man who helped bring about the golden age, who helped end the golden age, and helped bring about the animation renaissance. I think a book about him is appropriate, don't you? Thank you so much for your time. Questions? Yes. So after the strike, Walt was still in business. Yes. And then built theme parks and then had to deal with lots of other unions. So how did he feel in your research about unions after that? I know I mean, it was very bitter for him to go through this, but did he ever come around to kind of making peace with unions? Or? That, the questions about how he dealt with the unions of television and the unions, like because he was, as we all know, he, he ruled television in a lot of ways. And the theme park, I don't know. That's not my area of expertise. I can tell you that the Disney strike, the animators union, and the, the bitterness of that stayed with him for the rest of his life. So much so that his children knew that it still pained him decades after. And for that reason, it's something that his daughter Diane carried with her for a long, long time. She remembered very clearly how much it wounded him. In her words, the two greatest tragedies of her father's life was the death of his mother and the strike. I mean, to put those two things side by side says something about the strike. Yes? Hi, I'm Sandy Bacon. Uh, I communicated with you. My parents worked at Disney, uh, Gambia, and Asia. And then my dad worked after the war. He retired back and he worked on uh, Sunday And you don't find any record of and I've been covering the uh, writer's strike since day one, thinking that my parents walked out <laughs> because they were, it was, Bambi was in production, right? 1939. I sent you a picture of my dad in the cutting room, and the can said Bambi, um, said uh, Pinocchio on it, because he worked on Pinocchio. So As we're Pinocchio, that was 1939. Well, Pinocchio was released at the beginning of 1940. Also, oh, the production yeah. was in 1939. The editors had their own union. They actually marched out in sympathy with the animators. And then a contract was signed, a kind of sneaky contract was signed, uh, that forced the editors to go back I to work. Wonder, I wondered why my dad's name is anyway. And I think it's because they, they weren't really good about giving credit to people in the department. You know, my mother was the best friend of ours, champion, who called me high, and she didn't do very. She was an airbrush artist, and my dad was a fan. And they're all dancers. I'm the only person I can talk to. I'll talk to you anytime. Interesting. So the the airbrush department, if you look at some of these inking and painting professionals were so spot on. If you want to read more about the inking and painting, pick up Mindy Johnson's amazing book, Ink and Paint. Uh, airbrushing was something that was that was done in those early Disney films. And it's just so incredible. But the airbrush department in 1941, beginning of 41, was phased out. And those airbrush artists, there were like uh, maybe a dozen of them, um, all, all women, or as they called them, girls, the airbrush girls, uh, they were all given a chance to, um, I guess, audition for a job, but the, their, their, uh, their training or their, um, like their trial period was only going to be two weeks. Whereas before, a new artist had like a, a four or six week trial. So that's something that really angered and frustrated these pro-union artists. Why can't these airbrush women have the same sort of grace that a new hire had after they've been working there for so long? So a lot of things were changing over that time, especially because the war was affecting the studio. Yeah. Do you have any insight into Disney corporate 1941 to what's happening today? Uh, no, I no, I don't. I really, I really don't. And I, um, all I know is that, as I said, the animators still have their union. Um, there are there's a lot of stuff going on 
with the, the walk around characters, not just at Disneyland, but at Walt Disney World, they've been fighting as well. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm a historian. I focus on things that already happened. And I don't, that things, things changing and things staying the same, I can look at it, but I really don't know enough about what's going on now. I do think, though, that um, someone was saying before that technology is a cause for change. And just as, you know, just as Walt was trying to record Steamboat Willie, he almost couldn't because he writes in a letter back home to Roy that the musicians union was stymieing his attempt to get performers, musical performers, in the recording booth. Eventually it all worked out, as we know. But technology, recording, soundtracks, this was changing things. This was changing unions. Um, technology always changes things and always changes unions and always changes efforts and gives people a desire to have job security. Um, that's just part of it. I don't think... Thank you. Bye, Josh. Thank you, guys. Thank you to Josh. Thank you, Josh. So, um, outside of how technology can change or not change an industry, um, I really... I, I really don't know. If you can ask me something about something that happened decades ago, I might be able to help you, though. Sorry, I try to stay out of that, to be honest with you, because I have a book coming out, f published by Disney, called Disney Afternoon, The Making of a Television Renaissance. So the reason why this book, I feel, uh, needs to be written is because Diane Disney, Walt's daughter, opened the Disney Family Museum in San Francisco and has a whole permanent display about the Disney strike in a corner of the second floor, as well as addressing Walt uh, testifying at the House Un-American Activities Committee. Like that's in her museum, the Disney Family Museum. So rather than having people be misguided and think things that aren't true and vicious about Walt, I want to just put the truth out there. And being an animator, I know that animation is work. And it's hard. It's not a pixie wand. It's not Tinkerbell waving her magic. It's work. The magic of Walt Disney is not that he talked to a camera and waved his hands and poof, now Donald Duck is walking around. It's that he was able to get people aligned with his vision and organize such talent and get people to create something under one single tent pole. So that's, that's where I'm really impressed with Walt. I'm also impressed knowing that he's human and flawed. And the more of his flaws I uncover, the more I'm impressed with his accomplishments. He's not a saint. None of us is. He's a human. And despite his human frailties, he did some unbelievable things in his short life. Yes, Chris. So you, you kind of touched on this a moment ago, the, the nasty things that are said about Walt and all the rumors that are out there and the things that people repeat ad nauseum. Did some of those like rumors about Walt, for instance, you know, people say he was anti-Semitic, which is not true, but did some of that come from the strike? Because I know when you're on strike, you want to kind of, you know, tar and, and feather the people on the other side. So did any of that originate from strikers or did it come out of that or was that later? Yeah. All those rumors came. No, it did. During that time, I actually addressed that very thing in the book, that while the people on the inside were slandering the strikers for being communists, they, uh, probably because they were following the advice of like a big Hollywood strike leader named Herb Sorrell, who was very aggressive. He used to be a boxer. They, they started slandering the studio back and started calling Walt an anti-Semite. These, these, these um, uh, smears never started before. No one was saying that about Walt. In fact, I can say that confidently because one of the conversations that are, that's transcribed is just a few months before the strike in a strike, like a, like a, a union meeting, and they're talking about Walt in private without Walt there. Art Babbitt's talking about Walt too. They say a bunch of things about Walt. They say that he's misguided about unions. They say that he's short-sighted. They say that he overlooks the people at the bottom. They criticize him. They never say anything about him being anti-Semitic, not even in the privacy of their own meetings. So the fact that people are saying that after, it's a smear campaign, just like they're being accused of being communists. And 
those strikers who, who said it and continued to say it as they grew into older folks, like Bill Melendez. Bill Melendez is the person famous for the Peanuts, Charlie Brown specials. He would say that as an older guy. Well, of course, you know, Walt Disney was an anti-Semite. Well, this was their way of saying, you know, like kind of payback for all of Walt's success and kind of in a way like the South will rise again sort of thing. It was like, uh, don't forget the fight that we fought even if we're no longer, you know, in good terms with the studio. No? Well, thank you so much, everyone.